Bonjour Emmanuel, bonsoir. Bonjour pour toi, bonsoir pour nous. Merci. Alors, comme c'est la closing lecture, euh, je vais prendre un peu de liberté et te présenter en français parce que euh, je pense que tu es parmi les participants celui qui regrette sûrement le plus, enfin, probablement le plus, de ne pas être là en vrai. Alors, je vais essayer de, de faire comme si tu étais là, comme si tu étais à la maison et te parler en français et dire à tout le monde oui. qu'on euh, est content que tu sois là, que, que tu es une, un représentant de la France aux États-Unis et un brillant représentant, que tu as fait une brillante carrière après avoir fait Polytechnique ici en France. Tu es parti aux États-Unis et tu n'es pas revenu. Bon, c'est un peu dommage pour nous que tu ne sois pas revenu, mais c'est bien que tu sois parti. C'est bien que tu aies fait cette belle carrière qui n'était d'ailleurs pas finie, mais qui est brillante. Et donc, voilà, on est content de t'écouter sur ce sujet-là. Voilà. Bah, je vais dire en parlant en français au début. Alors, merci Dominique pour cette euh, très gentille introduction. Et Dominique, est-ce que tu peux me dire si tu vois mes, mes slides je vois tes slides, je te vois, euh, et je pense que tout le monde te voit. Très bien. So, um, uh, je vais parler en anglais alors, puisqu'on m'a demandé de parler en anglais. Um, ce que je vais dire, c'est que I was actually in Paris this time of the year in 2020, getting ready to give this lecture, just as the pandemic began to hit us all. Boy, I mean, if someone had then told me it would last this long. So I know it's been a long day and it's dinner time in France. So I'd just like to thank everyone for staying tuned in if you're still tuned in. And if not, then I understand perfectly. Uh, before I start, I would like to, uh, okay, let's see the, acknowledge uh, uh, people I've spoken to and who have helped me prepare for this lecture. And here they are. So uh, to begin with, I work at Stanford and my university is investing significant resources into AI. In particular, we launched a new institute just about two years ago on March 18, 2019. And a few celebrities, including Bill Gates, would you believe, attended the inaugural symposium. Henry Kissinger, a former US Secretary of State, was there and was the last to speak. And I remember his speech very well. He took questions from the audience and I remember one in particular And this was this, Mr. Kissinger, what can AI do for the government? Kissinger did not have an answer and one cannot blame him for this. He's simply not an AI researcher. The question has some merit though, and is important, I think. We should be asking this not just about AI, but just about any field of knowledge, including my own, namely statistics. In this case, I would um, argue that the contributions of statistics to government and to humanity in general are monumental. Uh, consider the fact that life expectancy has increased roughly 20 years over the last century, partly through the rigorous application of statistical hypothesis testing and of medical research, obviously. Likewise, tremendous advances in agricultural productivity have been made possible by experimental design and statistics and by crop research. In just a few slides, I will discuss dramatic improvements in manufacturing, statistical research, and Mike Jordan touched upon this. For example, Gaussian process theory is at the root of control theory and statistical communications. I'm thinking here of uh, Wiener, Shannon, and so on. Empirical process theory, regressions are at the roots of lots of machine learning today. Moving on to today, there are, I think, about a million papers published every year that use a form of statistical hypothesis testing. And I could go on and on and on with this list. Now, if I pause for a second, I would argue that a tri triumph of statistical research is certainly the design of rigorous clinical trials which have brought drugs, treatments, and vaccines to people which help them rather than hurt them. You see here on my slide, the poster child of this effort, the salt vaccine trial, which pretty much led to the eradication of polio in the US. In 2021, we are of course all too familiar with clinical trial. Uh, some of us, myself included, actually read detailed uh, field trial reports. I mentioned agriculture before. The history here is quite interesting. Uh, William Gosset, uh, statisticians would know him under the name of student, was hired by Guinness, yes, that's a beer company, at the beginning of the 20th century. And Gosset started then, so 
early 1900s, what is known today as A-B testing in agriculture. And I think it's not a hyperbole to say that within a few decades, um, agriculture was transformed. Part of this transformation was systematized by Fisher, who figured out uh, uniform systems of analysis of complex experiments. And you know, this is a very long story, and it's a fascinating story, but I'll cut it short. I'll say that the discipline of complex multifactorial experiments compounded over a period of time to produce a transformation in agriculture that we've seen in the 20th century. One outcome of this transformation has been called the Green Revolution, which basically fed India since 1960. Um, Short is considered the father of statistical process control, which is a method of quality control which employs statistical methods to monitor a control process. And this helps people ensure that a manufacturing process operates efficiently, producing more specification conforming products with less waste. And key tools here, again, in, you use in controlled charts and designs of experiments and so on. And what was remarkable in the 20th century, that all these ideas were shared and actually Deming, who you see listed on my slide, um, learned about the revolutionary development in field trials for agricultural statistics because he was working in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or he was collaborating the U.S. Department of Agriculture, sorry. And he then learned about the work of Short and uh, later, he was stationed in Japan and he used uh, these works and modern statistics to revamp assembly lines um, practice to reduce uh, defect rates and spread massive improvement in quality. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, statistics has been immensely successful over the last century. We eat better, we live longer, we enjoy better goodies because of progress in the field. In fact, I would argue that statistics is integrated into so many fundamental systems that it's easy to overlook or forget what has been actually achieved. And for this reason, I have every reason to believe that statistical reasoning will be every bit as important in this century as it was in the last. So um, it's time to turn to the subject of this conference, which is Mass Plus AI. And my goal today is to show you how stats can complement these activities. While these three disciplines surely intersect, I don't think it's productive to think of them as the same because they're surely distinct as well. So to drive this point home, uh, consider the essence of a statistical problem. Suppose that, for example, you have stored um, on your computer uh, all, the, all of Shakespeare's works and you're asking in particular, what you would know is you would know about all the words that the great poet uh, ever used and how many times he used each of them. The question is this now, how many words did Shakespeare know? Phrased a bit differently, how many words from his vocabulary did he not use? So by this, I mean that if you find, for example, an unattributed poem and were wondering if it could have been written by Shakespeare, how many new words would you expect to see in this poem? This problem is the same as that of estimating the number of unseen species and has a long history in the field of statistics going back to the 40s. I would submit, and this is now a personal submission, that you become a statistician the day you're capable of an educated answer. I would also submit that the answer is outside of what you typically learn in a math or in an AI course. I'm trying to be playful here, talking to you about Shakespeare. I will say this, however, a modern version of this problem is this. You work in a biomedical lab and you try to get a census of on types of cancer cells. After one year of work, how many types are you still missing? How many types have you not yet seen? And if you were to continue to work on your problem for six months, how many new types will you expect to see? during this period. I prepared a second example explaining why statistical reasoning is simply not the same as deductive reasoning. And this concerns the case of Lucie de Burke. Uh, Lucie is a Dutch nurse uh, who was arrested in 2001 
and sentenced to life in prison in 2004. Now in the Netherlands, I've been told that a life sentence means little or resist. It means life. You're gonna spend the rest of the li your life in prison. Now what's interesting about this case is that the case rested mainly on quasi-statistical considerations. In 2008, um, the case was reopened uh, thanks to the heroic efforts of a team of Dutch statisticians. And you see here uh, Richard Gill, a statistician from the University of Leiden, uh, who led the effort. I should point that reopening a case, uh, which was done in front of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, is extremely rare. Uh, consequently, uh, the defense uh, managed to demonstrate how the prosecution botched the analysis and presented a revised analysis, and Lucy de Berg was consequently acquitted. Now, you might be interested to know that uh, in the Netherlands, the story of Lucy de Berg has been elevated to the level of a national conversation. There's a blockbuster movie about the case that I would recommend you see. Now, what was the evidence against Lucy? It re in reality, it took the form of basically three two by two tables. So it's extremely simple, each corresponding to an hospital ward where she worked. In each case, the court had, had access to the total number of shifts, the number of shifts where Ms. de Burke was present versus not, and the number of shifts where an incident occurred versus not. An incident here is an unexplained death. And so, for example, if we look at table number two, for example, we can see that there were five unexplained, de unexplained deaths and um, Lucy was on shift for one of them. So, it is on the basis of this table that Ms. de Burke was charged and convicted of seven murders. So how do we think about these tables? I would once again submit that you're becoming a professional statistician and the day you understand how to weigh the evidence against Lucy, the day you can write down defendable models that take into account heterogeneities. Maybe Ms. de Burke took harder shifts. Maybe she worked night shifts when incidents are more likely to occur. And finally, I would submit that you become a professional the day you question the data in front of you. Is the data trustworthy? Who collected the data? For what purpose? What is missing? Once again, I submit that these are very important questions. They're in this case, uh, little questions of almost life and death, spending the rest of your life in prison or not. And I'd submit that educated answers to all these questions are typically found in the stats course. All right, so having said all of this, I want to go back to the to this lecture and um, talk a bit about the future, because I think uh, it's very exciting to have AI. I use AI tools a lot, and by that I mean what Michael Jordan says. I use machine learning tools a lot. I have lots of Python notebooks on my computers that start with import PyTorch, import TensorFlow, import XGBoost, and I would want to know how statistical reasoning can com complement these great tools and also can complement uh, mathematical thinking. And so I think that what I'm going to try to do in the rest of this lecture is to show this complementarity. So um, these are the tools I use, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with. I don't think I need to belab belabor these tools. Uh, in fact, uh, just, you know, one of this photo, one gentleman on this photo, I was a previous speaker. Jerry Friedman is my colleague at Stanford, and I basically use all the tools he produces. So we are using very complicated tools, uh, you know, neural nets, XGBoost, they're very hard to understand if you ask me, um, and people are getting comfortable using them. Um, there are two things I'd say that we can absolutely not surrender. One is replicability. And so we want to make sure that as we use these very complex tools, and for this, for this talk, I'm going to say that they're so complicated that I'm going to consider them basically as black boxes. They don't have to be black boxes, but it's going to be simple to consider them as black boxes. And so we want to make sure that the conclusions I draw today need to hold up tomorrow. 
And so we're going to see how statistical reasoning can help with this. And the second is reliability. You know, I make a series of predictions, are they valid? And how do I com communicate the uncertainty around my predictions? So we're going to start with the first problem, which has to do with replicability with black box predictors. And just to set the stage, people have heard me talk about this before. Uh, you should be aware that uh, there's sort of a replicability crisis at the moment. Um, this has been uh, discussed heavily in the literature and continue to be discussed heavily uh, in the media. I will just say this, that for example, Amgen, which is a biotech company based in Southern Oaks, California, uh, took 53 studies that they considered to be absolutely landmarks in basic cancer science and set out to replicate them, and they could only replicate six of 53. And this problem is not only in, in this field, in cancer science, but it's in psychology, neuroscience, and so on and so forth. And so when we make discoveries and we need to claim discoveries, we need to be careful and need to make sure that they hold up. And so let's consider a very, uh, not a simple problem, a complicated problem, which a lot of geneticists have, which is as follows. You know, today, as you know, we can sequence the entire genome and we can take, we can measure genotype information at hundreds of thousands of locations. And the basic question after we collect all this data is of course, which genetic variations affect the trait? For example, the risk of developing a certain form of cancer or the risk of developing Crohn's disease. And so the problems, the basic problems that scientists face is that of selecting relevant variables, in this case, genetic variants, without too many false positives. So that we, of course, do not run into the problem of irreproducibility. So how are we gonna do this? And this is, of course, a very challenging problem because maybe I want to use my best machine learning tools to actually solve this problem. And I'm gonna use the latest uh, and great algorithm that my colleague, Jerry Friedman, has developed, where I'm gonna be able to score variables I search that, so perhaps a high score indicates um, of an important variance that can perhaps be replicated. But the problem is that the, uh, the dimensionality is so high, the problem is so complex that we have tremendous statistical variability from one sample to the next. This is what you would get from one sample. The model doesn't change. This is what you get from a second sample. So how do you make decisions in the face of unknown statistical variability. And I think Johan Benjamini and Johan Heschlinger uh, said it very nicely, that really is a problem of modern science is that of selecting promising fi findings from the very noisy estimates of many. In particular, your black box algorithms gives you high scores for this variance, and should you actually report them? Should you write an abstract about the fact that these variants are important? So we thought about this problem and just to show you a little bit how statistical reasoning can help think about this problem. Let's say we have lots of variables labeled x1 through xp and a response y and we posit that we want to understand this response y and we want to understand the distribution of y given x depend on which variable. So it's exactly what I meant here which is a distribution of people with a disease or not depend on which genetic variants. Obviously, you measured everything because you can. It's likely that the susceptibility of a disease only depends upon a few genetic variants, and you would like to find them with as few positives, false positives as possible. So what we introduced here is a method, um, which the first time you look at it might be a bit strange, but again, has a lot of statistical reasoning underpinning underneath. And so what you're going to do is you're going to get the data set that the biologists gave you, and you're going to construct fake genetic variants, what we call in English knockoffs. And knockoff is just a word that means it's a fake. It's, um, and so we're going to, for each thing that has been measured, each genetic variant that has been measured, we're going to, me we're going to construct a fake variant. And then we're going to run our favorite machine learning algorithm on both the original features, the one that have been collected in the lab, 
and the fake variant that have been created by the computer. And the, the nice thing about this construction is if a genetic variant has no influence on a trait, then the knockoffs are constructed in such a way that what comes out of the black box, you are going to get a red, a red value for the knockoff of a feature. And if that feature does not have an influence on the trait, then it provides a fair comparison. The two scores you get are very comparable in the sense that they follow the same distribution and the technical term is that they're exchangeable. So you have a fair comparison. And then what the procedure does, it uses, um, it's going to try to tease out the signal from the noise by looking at values of your feature importance above threshold, looking at both what happens on the true side, on the side that correspond to true variables and what happens on the knockoff sides. And then I should say that there is sort of a clever filter that would actually look at this comparison and be able to make a final selection of what is safe to report. And by that, I mean that you, it, it leads to a discovery process with FDR guarantees in finite samples. And so just to emphasize the role of statistical reasoning here, um, what you have is what you get from the geneticist or from any field you want to work in is a data matrix, which looks like this, and everybody's familiar with them. And what you're going to do as a statistician is going to construct essentially fake variables, what I want to call negative controls, but they have to be done very carefully. And the way they have to be done, they have to be done in such a way that if I took a variable and swapped it with its knockoff, then you would not be able to tell that I did this. So if I were to take a column and take a knockoff column and swap them, you cannot tell whether or not I did this. And the other thing is this is computer generated. And when you compute X wiggle to achieve this property, uh, you're not looking at Y. You're not looking at the phenotype. So going to the themes of this conference and going to mathematics, what you can do is you can set uh, mathematics in motion. In particular, you can set in motion the theory of martingales. Um, and you can get a result that looks like this, that if you follow the procedure that I've just described, that is, you create fake variables and then you tease them apart with the filters that I've discussed, then you can show that the false discovery rate, that is the expected value of false positive over the number of selection, can be below 0 0.1 or 0 0.05 or any other user input. So in that sense, if you apply this procedure, the rate of replicability throughout science is controlled. Then there's a mathematical question, which is how do you construct knockoffs? And this is a very beautiful math problem. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to um, give you and explain this beautiful math problem uh, in details. But basically, all you get access to is a distribution of x. So you get the distribution of a set of features x, uh, which you see in blue here. And what you want to do is you want to be able to augment this family of random variable with a new family of random variable in red, such that if you were to take any pair and swap them, you don't destroy the distribution. The distribution is preserved. And that means that you need to be able to find the right conditional distribution for the knockoffs, given what you've observed, so that you have this symmetry property. And how you do this is not uh, trivial. It involves a lot of ideas from graphical models, from graph theory, from Markov chain Monte Carlo, and especially Metropolis Hastings type ideas and so um, today we're in a position where, you know, for pretty much any distribution P of X, we would know how to build knockoffs. So the connection with machine learning and AI, are obviously, uh, I think they're obvious, the scoring and the way you assess importance can be done with any machine black box algorithm, one that exists and, and one that are yet to be developed. And there's another connection which I find kind of nice, which is that 
Well, in lots of applications, you would not know P of X. You know, how do you know the distribution of your features? And again, here, a bit inspired by GAN and all the work on um, general, general uh, adversarial networks, uh, it is possible to actually build to good accuracy um, knockoff variables, these negative controls, by using ideas from machine learning slash AI. And so what you're going to do roughly is you're going to generate knockoffs through a generative algorithm and then you're going to try to discriminate. Are you exchangeable or not? And so you're going to have a measure of, of exchangeability and you're going to keep on improving the generation mechanism until you, know, you cannot really reject the hypothesis that the thing is not exchangeable. And so even when you don't have a distribution for X, you can still um, build knockoffs using some of the ideas we've seen in AI. So um, this is uh, a work that has a goal, and the, work, the goal is ultimate data analysis. Here I show you uh, results in the field of genetics, which has been motivated, motivating this work for me. Uh, and so it's been the, 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 a privilege to work with students and collaborators on this. And so you can apply these ideas in genetics where it's very easy to, well, it's easy. No, it's not easy, but we have good models to, because we know a lot about human population and the, and the mechanism of genetic inheritance. We have very good model for the distribution of genotypes. Therefore, we can build knockoffs at scale. And so we have published papers where we analyze 500,000 individuals assaying 500,000 uh, genetic variants at the same time. And when you apply all of these ideas, of course, you have FDR control, so you report things that can be replicated. And because you can leverage all the great feature important statistics that we have from AI, instead of using marginal models, um, you get lots of new scientific findings, which I think is exciting. So, uh, because we are using multivariate models as opposed to using marginal models, which is the, essentially the way to go in genetics these days, uh, we can make discoveries that are uh, very precise. And not only we have more discoveries, but we can localize them extremely uh, with great precision uh, in the genome, whereas uh, marginal methods have a hard time uh, doing something like this. Okay, so I addressed uh, a first uh, topic, which is a topic of replicability. And uh, of course, I'm glossing over so many details that I feel extremely guilty, but I hope you get the idea that by using statistical reasoning and AI and math, uh, you can address lots of uh, problems of scientific interests. I would like to turn now to the second thing that I decided to talk about, which is how do we get reliable predictions from a black box? Um, and so I think uh, Michael uh, spoke very eloquently about this. Uh, and I think I don't need to convince you that, you know, I started to work a bit on the Netflix problem in 2005 and whether honestly you get uh, predictions of whether I'm going to like a movie or not, it has very little consequence. But now we use tools and machine learning tools to make critical decisions, you know, self-driving cars, disease diagnostics, and the question is, can we have confidence in these predictions? And so um, just to take an example, I'm not saying it's a real example, but that's something that perhaps can help your imagination. Um, suppose I have a, a learning system that wants to use data about applicants to universities, to colleges, and try to predict how each applicant is going to do if she or he is admitted to, say, Stanford. So we could have applicants and they come with lots of features, the high schools they went to, their grades, the kind of courses they took, their extracurricular activities, whatever you can measure. And we can surely measure a lot of things these days. And then you would turn this in, you would feed this into a predictive engine, which would say, I predict that this student after two years of college would have a GPA of 3.62 or any other quantitative or even qualitative outcome you might care about. Of course, these predictions will have tremendous consequences because we'll make decisions based on them. 
I think one thing that I'm wondering often is why don't we see prediction intervals more often? That is, why don't we just see more calibrated predictions so that we actually know, the decision makers know what has been really learned from the experience of others? And so if I'm trying to express this a bit mathematically, I would say that perhaps a better way to communicate the results of a machine learning algorithm is not through a point prediction because the cost of the wrong decision can be enormous, but rather through perhaps a predictive interval. So a predictive interval here, C of X, constructed from the data would have the following property. I would want to have that on future samples, that is out of samples, that the chance that the true label Y fall into the predicted range is 90% or 95% or 99%, whatever. And I want to do this without making any modeling assumption and by using any kind of machine learning algorithm you like. And the question is, how can you achieve this? And you know, a natural answer would be, well, it's impossible. You're making no modeling assumption. You can use any algorithm under the sun it's impossible to achieve something like this, but it's actually surprisingly doable. And that's what I'll, I'll talk about. To show you a possible solution to this problem, let's assume that the distribution of Y given X is known, in which case I gave away the problem. And so for each value of X, and I can only plot in 2D, so X is univariate and Y is univariate, but we have to imagine that we can have thousands of covariates. But for each value of x, you would compute the upper quantile of the distribution of y given x, you would calculate the lower quantile, you would join the quantile, you would get your quantile functions as a function of x, and by definition, you would y would be within range 90% of the time. But as you all know, you know, if I knew the distribution, the prob every problem would be solved, I don't have a distribution, all I have is a sample. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we're gonna to try to combine two ideas here. One is an old idea from statistics, which goes under the name of regression quantiles. After all, we need to estimate the quantiles of the distribution of Y given X. And one way to do this is by doing quantile regression. So you take your favorite learning algorithm F, and it might be a neural net, it might be XGBoost, it might be a combination of them, whatever you like. And instead of have using a loss function, which is quadratic, which essentially tries to estimate the conditional mean of y given x, what you would do is you would change the loss function to use a loss function, which has a beautiful name. It's called the pinball loss. And so uh, without going into too many details, you would recognize that if alpha were 0.5, so that my pinball loss would function would be symmetrical, then you would minimize the uh, uh, absolute value of the error. So you would essentially try to find the conditional mean of y given x, uh, the conditional median of y given x, sorry. And by tilting the slope, you would find the percentiles of y given x. And so you can say, that's a great idea. I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to change the loss function to find the quantiles of y given x. And does this work? And the answer is no, it doesn't. I mean, you are in high dimensions. Um, you're very far from any form of asymptopia that I know of. Um, and so when I tried this on a, on a real data set, you know, I want a target coverage level to be 90%. I got on future samples something which is more like 65%, which is totally unacceptable. Now, 65% is not completely dramatic, but it's not good. By the way, imagine that you're training a neural net where you can get a zero training error, then of course the actual coverage would be through the roof, uh, would be almost zero because the two quantiles would be the same. All right, so this is where the work of this gentleman, Vladimir Vov, comes into play. Uh, and so we're gonna marry quantile regression with conformal inference, which was started by this computer scientist named Vladimir Vov, who has influenced my research in the last few years. Uh, enormously. So I'm going to uh, introduce quant formalized quantile regression or CQR for short. And how does this work? So what you can do is 
you give me a training sample and I can split, split it into a proper training set and a calibration set, right? So I have the black points and the, and the, and the green points and I perform a random split. And on the training set, I'm just going to apply a quanta regression. And on the calibration set, I'm going to check how well I'm doing. And so on the calibration set, I can, of course, put my quantiles, and I'm going to score the calibration points. And how do I score the calibration points? Um, this is a novelty here. What we're going to do is we're going to take each point, uh, each green point, which is a calibration point, and we are going to assign it a score, and the score is the assigned distance to the nearest quantile. So if a point is outside of the predicted range, it gets a positive score. And if it's inside the predicted range, it gets a negative score. And so you're here, you're positive, and you get the score, which is this distance. Here you're negative, and you get a score, which is this, is this distance. And then, you know, if I have 300 points, I get 300 scores, and I can look at the histogram of these scores, which is what you see on the right. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cal calculate the quantile of these scores. I'm going to calculate the 90th percentile of this score, which roughly speaking is this number. So it's a single number, and let's say is 0 0.5 in this, in this case. And all what you're going to do now is you're going to take your uncalibrated interval that you fitted with your machine learning algorithm using this loss function I talked about, and you're going to either enlarge it or shrink it using this, quant this number Q. Note that if you had done a perfect job on finding the right quantiles, well, roughly, you would expect 10% of the point to be outside of range, 90% of the point to be inside range, so Q would be essentially zero, and you would not touch your quantiles. If you were a bit too aggressive, uh, you would have too many points outside of range, Q would be positive, and so you would enlarge your, your, your region. If you were too conservative, a bit like me, Q might actually be negative, and this would actually give you an opportunity to shrink your confidence region. And so when you apply this idea on future data, it's almost too good to be true, uh, you get that the actual coverage, at least in this realization, is 90.09%. So you say, well, that's too good to be true. And yeah, maybe, but it's also an, an, a theorem that what you can show using these very simple ideas, using this wrapper around your machine learning algorithm, that you can calibrate any prediction you like in the sense that the predict the, 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 the interval you built according to this rule has exactly the predictive property that you want, that is 90% of the time you will contain the true label. And note that in any of this, I've made no distribution, uh, no assumption on the distribution of X and Y, this is totally model free, no assumption on the sample size, and no, in fact, it works with any quantile regression estimate you may ever want to use. So uh, this method can calibrate any predictive algorithms to give valid ranges on future samples. And we've applied it to lots of data sets across a wide range of fields. I'm just going to show you one example. I'm, I'm telling you ahead of time, the plots are kind of boring because uh, you want 90%, you're going to get exactly 90%. But this data set has the following property, which um, is as follows, we want to predict healthcare system utilization as measured by the number of visits to a doctor's or a hospital and so on. And we have lots of features to try to make these predictions, including your age, your marital status, your race, and we're going to talk about this in a, in a moment, you know, your functional limitation, your health status, the kind of health insurance you have, and so on and so forth. And you run this algorithm and you can wrap them around random forest or neural net. It doesn't matter. The average, co the coverage you get is 90%. It's always spot on 90%. In this case, what well, we can see that the length of the predictive intervals are a bit shorter for neural nets than for random forests. Okay, so 
Um, a little piece of news uh, is that this method of getting calibrated prediction was used by the Washington Post to project the election uh, during the last election cycle in the United States uh, in November 2020. Uh, this is not my work. This is the work of John Sheerian and Lenny Bronner. And uh, they actually used a variation on this model to show the readers of the Washington Post what to expect at the end of the election. And so they ran, ran a variation of the model, and maybe I'll focus on this graph, which I like a lot. This was taken from the Washington Post webpage, uh, November 5th, 2020, uh, early in the morning at 12.50 a.m. Uh, East Coast time. And what they were doing is they were actually using data about counties that had already reported to predict uh, what would come out when all counties had reported, so un unreported counties. And because we make these calibration predictions, we have, of course, a, a, a level of confidence that we can attach to these uh, predictions. And this was very nicely encoded by these kind of shades of blue and red, showing us the most likely with a, a, a display of uncertainty about what we'll see at the end of the election. And for the key states of Pennsylvania, the model was predicting that Joe Biden will be ahead, and, and that's what we eventually saw. Okay, uh, Dominique, do I have two or three minutes to talk about fairness a bit, or am I out of time? Yeah, yeah, two or three minutes, that's okay. Two or three minutes. So I, my, my point was perhaps at this point to just broaden the discussion a bit and uh, see where these ideas can take us. And this is work with uh, this wonderful team that you see below. Uh, it's a different take on fairness in machine learning. Um, and I'll, I'll just to explain my point of view, I will not detail it because I'm a bit short on time, but of course you know that we need to be extremely careful with predictions. Uh, I'm personally very uncomfortable with using tools that make a prediction that say whether a person will commit another crime if released from jail or not. Um, but we know that these tools exist, they're used by courts, and it's been demonstrated that they can suffer from some bias. So we need to be extremely careful with what we do. So I think a quick question for a statistician slash data scientist like myself is as I use machine learning to support import, important decision, who gets, who is going to get bailed, who is going to be admitted to college, who is going to get paroled, and so on. How do I communicate uncertainty to decision makers and not overstate what can be in, inferred from the black box? And how do, can I do such a thing so that everybody is treated equitably? So I think there's a bit of a confusion, and it's just my take at the moment in machine learning, that people tend to conflate the policy problem with the risk assessment problem, but they are distinct. One thing, one thing is to be able to co pre correct, predict correctly the chance that, say, a defendant would commit another crime is released from jail, and other is to make a policy decision. And so I'm a bit... Um, I, I look at the literature on machine learning and, and fairness, and, and sometimes I'm a bit skeptical because it seems that a lot of people are encoding into algorithms a certain notion of fairness. But when I talk to legal scholars and when I look at papers in legally, we don't even agree on what fairness is. So how can we encode something that we don't even agree on? So I would like to offer an alternative and the alternative is this, which is, all right, you want to learn from the experience of others, you want to make predictions. Well, how about you summarize honestly what you've learned from the experience of others? And by that I mean, well, you have data, you have trained your machine learning algorithm, give me what is the predicted range for an outcome of interest. And not only is this, but so that is well calibrated, that's number one, this is what we've been talking about, but not only this, but do it in such a way that you do not discriminate against people. And by that, I mean, give me a calibrated range which is, holds true no matter the group you belong to. For example, as you can see on my slide, no matter whether you're male or female, white or non-white, 
older and young and so on. And so if we apply the techniques that I have talked about, um, we can actually deliver to decision makers calibrated interval that would be unbiased in the sense that they apply regardless of the group you belong to. It robustly quantifies uncertainty. And if the interval is long, so be it. It means that I cannot really learn from the experience of others about your future or what will happen if I do X, Y, Z. And because it's calibrated across groups, I think it treats people incredibly. Now, when you use this in the medical world, you'll see, for example, that the predictive intervals for women are longer than those for men. And the reason is this, and it's simple. We have more data for men than for women. And so what the different thing lengths in this calibrated predictive interval will tell you is just about time to start collecting data about women rather than men. So just to go back to the example I was, I was presenting before, and then uh, this is my last slide. You know, when we fitted neural nets on, you know, healthcare utilization services, we actually could observe empirically that the neural net, for some reason, I'm not sure I understand why, but for some reason, tended to overestimate the response for the non-white group and underestimate the response for the white group. You know, I don't know why it did so, but that's why we could observe. Even though <clears throat> there were more non-whites than whites in the, in the sample, and so if you follow a bit what I'm saying is what you can do is you can use the method that we've been talking about to recalibrate this predictive interval so that they have exactly the same predictive accuracy, no matter you're white and non-white. And so uh, we've done this and we've shown that, you know, we could get exactly the accuracy, but it's a theorem if you follow what I'm saying, it, you can get exactly the accuracy you want on any group you want. So uh, I think uh, it's time for me to conclude. Uh, we can use these ideas to do many other things, but I don't have time to discuss them. In particular, we can do counterfactual analysis and go to question of causality, but my time is short, so I would just want to thank you for your attention. I know that it's dinner time. At least I know I managed to avoid the PSG game, which is tomorrow. And in any event, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Okay, we thank you a lot for this very, uh, very inspiring and concluding uh, talk uh, with many ideas. I mean, uh, in, in different direction, and uh, we had some some questions and uh, some quite different questions. Some are quite technical, and uh, and uh, somebody asked, "What do you mean by exchangeable? Can you give an example where it's not?" Do you consider time series as non-exchangeable? Time series are usually non-exchangeable because exchangeability means so two random variables, and so I'm sorry to be a bit technical here, two random variables are exchangeable if the distribution of x, y is the same as the distribution of y, x. So that is, um, I, I need a blackboard, I don't have a blackboard, but um, the typical example is you have urns, uh, balls in an urn, and you have blue balls and red balls, and you ask uh, what's the color of the first ball and what's the color of the second ball, and these two random variables will be exchangeable. A very special case of exchangeability is uh, to be IID, because if data is IID, which is commonly assumed in machine learning, uh, uh, then uh, you're exchangeable by definition. You're more than exchangeable. Um, now, there was a second part to the question. No, but there is another question, which is a bit uh, uh, quite sharp. Can you tell me more about the difference between quantile random forest algorithm of Meinschausen and conformal prediction interval algorithm? Yes, so the, 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 these are very different algorithms, first of all. We use as a building block the work of Kanker and Bassett to get quantile regression curves but we calibrate them in totally different ways. So for example, I'm not aware that the work of, so if we go back to the theory, for example, to just show you how different they are, uh, I'm not aware that the work of Meinshausen uh, would be able to give you uh, coverage guarantees which are model-free, holds no matter the dimensionality, holds no matter the sample size. 
And so what's new here is a marriage of conformal regression and this wonderful field of conformal inference that from both together to give you the guarantee that you want. So it's we if you look at the paper, we actually cite uh, the work of Meinshausen. Meinshausen is a fantastic statistician whom I admire greatly, um, but it's quite different. Okay. And uh... I will uh, conclude maybe by uh, uh, a question of mine. Uh, in the in the construction of knockoff, mm -hmm. uh, do you experiment uh, a curse of dimensionality or? Uh... No, I, I think what limits us is um, no. I think we don't. I mean, I, I don't know what you mean by curse of dimensionality. What we need to do is we need to say, I want, if we have a generative model for X, um, then we can construct knockoffs. And so there is no um, curse of dimensionality in the sense that I'm familiar with. So we, it's all about our ability to generate valid negative control. Now, what we need to be careful about, uh, um, Dominique, is that we need to make sure that we can construct knockoff that are sufficiently distinct from the original variable so that we can create some contrast. When we score the variables, we want to be able to see different scores for variables that matter. And that is whether we can do this or not, which is a, a key design in the construction of knockoffs, has to do with the dimension. Of course, if you have a lot of features, there are a lot, lots of correlations, it's going to be very hard to build this contrast. But I could also submit that in this case, when we have lots of features that are very highly correlated, the question you ask, which variable is the culprit, is also very hard to answer. It's a hard statistical problem to answer. Mm -hmm. So it's more com com complicated, but that's not the curse of dimensionality. No, it's it's not, there's no curse of dimensionality. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. So I think it's if uh, there is no other question uh that i don't see and uh, there is a lot of thanks for your talks then i will uh, thank you a lot for being there and uh, giving wonderful lecture so thank you emmanuel <laughs>